The challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One King, on you huskies. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush with Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Lee Durham and Hank Bristow had been friends since boyhood. When news of the Klondike gold strike had filtered through to their home in the east, the two young men had thrown up their jobs in spite of their parents' protests and had joined in the frenzied rush to the Yukon Territory. After prospecting unsuccessfully throughout the summer and fall of 98, they had finally staked out a claim on Venture Creek. But the claim hadn't paid off. And as the weeks went by, they grew more and more discouraged. One day, while they were working their claim, Hank paused to pan out a sample of the gravel. Yeah, look. There's not even a speck of gold dust in this rotten gravel. Oh, take it easy, Hank. Maybe we haven't gone down far. Enough. We've been telling ourselves that for the last two months. <sighs> Can't quit now, Hank. Got to keep on working the claim. It's our only hope. I tell you, it's played out. Where are you going? Into the cabin. With a worried look on his face, Lee Durham threw down his pick and followed Hank into the cabin. Uh, all right. So well licked. I may as well admit it. It's about time. I've been afraid to face it, but it's true. Claim is played out. Well, what are we going to do about it? We're flat broke. The only one thing we can do. We have to rustle up jobs and earn enough money to get us back home. <laughs> It'll sure look fine, won't it? We come up here to make our fortunes and wind up going home broke with our tails between our legs. I'll rub it in. I have to face it, that's all. Maybe you will, but I won't. What do you mean? I mean I'm not going home broke, that's for sure. Well, what are you going to do? We can't get any gold out of our claim, then by thunder I'll get it somewhere else. What are you driving at, Hank? Joe Moline has mined over $40,000 worth of gold. He's got it stowed away in his cabin. Hank, for the love of Mike, you're not thinking of robbing him, are you? Why not? An old coot like him will never live long enough to spend forty grand. Well, that's not the point. Robbery's a crime. And it's wrong. Yeah? And what about us? We work our heads off and wind up with nothing to show for it, while Joe strikes it rich. Is that fair? No. We've had rotten luck. I realize that, but, but still... In still all in all that... my eye. Suppose we were to take part of his gold. Not all of it, just part of it. Say, about 10,000 in that 40 grand. That'd still leave him plenty. Wouldn't that be a lot fairer than the way things stand now? Well, I don't know. You put it that way, it doesn't seem quite so bad. All right, then. How about it? Oh, no. No, I can't do it. Use your head, Lee. Think what we can do with that money. With 5000 apiece, we can go back home and make a real start in life. You can marry Helen. It'd sure be swell. What about the risk? What's risky about it? Well, go to his cabin tonight after he's asleep. We know right where he keeps his gold, so it won't take long to grab a couple of pokes. Maybe he won't even wake up. Fat chance he keeps his gold under his bunk. Well, even if he does wake up, it'll be dark, so he won't be able to recognize us. We can wear handkerchiefs over our faces if it'll make you feel any better. Oh, what if he puts up a fight? An old man like Joe? <laughs> we can handle him easily. We'll tie him up and gag him. Then what? We'll come back here and hide the gold and sit tight. For how long? We'll have to wait for a couple of weeks so it won't look suspicious. Then we'll clear out and go back to the States. Well, what do you say? All right. We'll do it. The rest of the day, Lee and Hank spent moping around their cabin, waiting tensely for nightfall. Hank was particularly restless. And as darkness closed in, he put on his parka and went outdoors to try to walk off some of his tension. A few moments later, he came rushing back in the cabin. Hey, Lee! What's the matter? There's no light in Moline's cabin. He must have gone away somewhere. Um, maybe he's turned in for the night. This early? It's not five o'clock yet. Come on, now's our chance. Let's go to his cabin and grab that gold before he gets back. Okay. Guess you're right. If we're going to do it, we may as well get it over with. We'll take a gun and some rope with us, just to be on the safe side. Joe Moline's cabin was located about half a mile down the creek. After approaching the cabin, Lee and Hank circled around cautiously to make sure Joe was nowhere in the immediate vicinity. 
Well, are you satisfied that Joe's not around anywhere? I still can't be sure he's not asleep inside the cabin. And if you're still worried, we'll tie handkerchiefs over our faces. Yeah, I think we'd better. A moment later, with bandanas tied over their faces, the two men advanced softly toward the front door of the cabin. Hey, wait a minute. Are we sure we want to go through with this? Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of scared myself. Then let's go back. It's not too late. No, we've got to go through with it. We need that gold. Now, come on. All right. Are you sure you unloaded that revolver? Sure, I'm sure. Open that door as quietly as you can. The room was pitch dark, making it impossible to see the old man's bunk. You stay here. I'll go over and see if he's on his bunk. Softly, Hank tiptoed through the darkness toward the point where he knew the old man's bunk was located. Hearing no sound of breathing, he reached out his hand and touched the blankets. Sure enough, the bunk was empty. It's okay, Lee. He's not here. Strike a match and make sure. All right. Yeah. You satisfied? Yeah, I guess so. I'm going to take off this doggone handkerchief. <coughs> yeah, that's better. Now let's see about that gold. Hey, Lee, the gold's gone. Are you sure? Take a look for yourself. Wait a second, I strike another match. <coughs> All right. What do you suppose he's done with it? I don't know. He must have hit it someplace else before he left. Looks like we're out of luck. Maybe not. Light the lamp. We'll take a look around the cabin. You think it's safe? We can risk it for a couple of minutes. All right. As the soft glow of the oil lamp dispelled the darkness, Lee gave a sudden cry of alarm. Hey. Huh? What's wrong? Look. Over there on the floor. Holy mackerel. It's Joe Moline. Uh, he's dead. Shot right between the eyes. We gotta get out of here. Yeah, you're right. Come on. Wait. Listen. Someone's coming. It's Kid Perry. What in thunder's going on here? Great day, you killed Joe. We didn't kill him. And what's your partner doing with a bandana over his face? I, you got us all wrong, kid. Don't give me that, Durham. What kind of a fool do you take me for? I tell you, this is a case with a mountain. Hold it, Perry. Now, wait a minute, Hank. You can't get away with killing me. Get your hands up and stand away from that door. What are you going to do, Hank? I'll keep him covered. You take that rope you brought and tie him up. But if we do that, it'll For look Pete's like... For sake, can't you see what a mess we're in? Once Perry tells his story, the Monty's were dead sure to be convicted of murder. But tying Perry up won't help. It'll, it'll just make things look worse, Don't Doris. be a fool. By the time someone comes along and turns him loose, we can be on our way to the border. It's our only chance to escape. Now hurry up and tie him. We've got no time to waste. Early the next morning, at Mounted Police Headquarters in Dawson, Sergeant Preston was called into the office of Inspector Conrad. You sent for me, Inspector? Oh, yes, Sergeant. Have a chair. Oh, thank you, sir. I have a new assignment for you. I suppose you've heard all about the Yukon Kid. Well, I know his record, sir. Bank robbery, murder. That's not what I mean. I was referring to what happened while you were out on patrol. Well, I haven't heard any news since I got back to town last night, sir. Well, the Yukon kid was seen in a cafe in Forty Mile just a few days ago. The man who recognized him tried to capture him. The Yukon kid pulled a gun and shot him dead. Posse went after him, but he got away. Any idea where he was heading? Yes, the men in the posse chased him for nearly 24 hours. They say he was heading in this way. So there's a good chance that he's hiding out either in or around Dawson. I see. I'm giving you the job of finding him, Sergeant. Have you ever seen his picture? Yes, sir. I've seen his picture on the reward notices. Well, here's a new handbill that's just been printed. Oh, I see they've upped the reward to 10000 Yes, the bank and the express company chipped in another 5000 Come in. Inspector. Yes, Constable, what is it? There's a man here named Gideon Perry. He came to report a murder. A murder? Yes, sir. Happened out on Venture Creek. Send him in right away. All right, Perry. Go on in. Come on in, Perry, and have a chair. I'm Inspector Conrad, and this is Sergeant Preston. Well, howdy. Now, let's have the facts. In the first place, who was murdered? An old miner named Joe Moline. Lived out on Venture Creek. His cabin is located just a little ways up the creek from mine. Tell us what had happened. Well, yesterday evening, I was in my cabin, and I heard a shot. It seemed to come from Joe's place. So I rushed out to see what was the matter. There was a light in his cabin, and I went up and looked in the window. And what did you see? I saw Joe Moline stretched out on the floor, and two men bending over him. One of them was holding a smoking gun. Did you recognize the man? I sure did. The man with the gun was a young fellow named Hank Bristow. The other fellow had a bandana over his face. But I realized right away it must be Hank's partner, Lee Durham. Who are they? Miners? That's right. 
They got it clean about half a mile from Joe's place. It ain't no good, though. Played out about a week or so after they started working it. Go on. Well, I opened the door and rushed in. Did you have a gun? Of course not. Why? Rather a dangerous thing to do, wasn't it? Rushing in to confront an armed killer? Well, I reckon I was so excited I didn't stop to think. Oh. Anyway, like I say, I rushed in and I caught him red-handed. Then what happened? Hank turned his gun on me. Told Lee Durham to tie me up. Then they grabbed Joe's gold and cleared out. Hank said something about heading for the border. How'd you manage to get loose? Well, they didn't do a very good job of tying me up. I fiddled with the ropes a couple of hours and finally got my hands loose. Did you check on Bristow and Durham before you came into town to report the murder? Yeah, I did, Sergeant. I sneaked up to the cabin and looked inside. Sure enough, they were gone. The place was cleaned out. Sergeant, I guess you'll have to hold off on that Yukon kid assignment for the time being. You're assigning me to this case, sir? That's right. You can put King on the center of Bristow and Durham. It should be easier to trail them. What about the body, sir? Take Constable Ross with you. He can bring the body back to town. Very well, Inspector. I'll start right away. Several hours later, the two Mounties, accompanied by Gid Perry, arrived at the dead man's cabin. Looking! Hi, Husky! Oh, oh, oh. This is just the way the body was lying after the shooting? That's right, Sergeant. I didn't touch it. Doesn't look as though there'd been any struggle. No. Evidently, it was shot in cold blood. Now, let's see. If Moline was facing toward the door, then the bullet must have lodged in the rear wall somewhere near the corner here. Can you find it, Sergeant? Not yet. No, wait a minute. Here it is. I'm thinking it out with my knife. In a few moments, the sergeant managed to pry the bullet loose. Huh? 45. Harry, you said Bristow and Durham took the old man's gold after they tied you up. That's right. Where was the gold? Moline kept it under his bunk. They knew it was hidden there? <laughs> Reckon every miner on the creek knew it. Joe was funny that way. He trusted everyone he knew, but he didn't trust Banks. He figured his gold was a lot safer here in his cabin, where he could keep an eye on it. What do Bristow and Durham look like? Well, they're both young. About 22 or 23, I reckon. Bristow's dark, uh, about six feet tall. Durham's blonde, a little shorter than Bristow. Constable, you'd better come with me when I go to the cabin. We'll get a general idea of which way they were headed, and you can pass the information along to the inspector. He'll want to telegraph word. Right, sir. Hey, what about me? Well, you're free to go, Perry. Thanks for the help you've given us. <laughs> well, there's no need to thank me, Sergeant. I was just doing my duty. All right, Constable, let's go. Come on, King. <laughs> Sergeant Preston and Constable Ross went to the cabin where Durham and Bristow had lived, and King quickly picked up the scent of the two fugitives. The Mounties followed their trail for a mile or so. And then Sergeant Preston called a halt. Looking! Hurry up! This is far enough, Alex. We know they're heading north. Probably hoping to make it to the border. There's something I want you to do before you go back to Dawson. What's that, Sergeant? You know where Frenchy LeClaire lives? Sure. Why? After you go back to get the body, stop off at Frenchy's place, leave your team with him, and go back on foot to get Perry's cabin. Then what? There's a good chance that Perry will go out to talk about the murder with some of the other miners along the creek. I want you to stay out of sight and keep a watch on him. As soon as he leaves, go in his cabin and search it thoroughly. Oh, search it for what? For Joe Moline's gold. Moline's gold? Wait a minute, let me get this straight. Do you think Perry had anything to do with the murder? I'm not sure, Alex, but his story sounds a little fishy. How so? He claims he caught two murderers red-handed. Yet, instead of killing him, they tie him up and leave him to tell his story to the police. Yes, if you think of it, that is strange. Anyhow, it won't hurt to check on him. Okay, Sergeant. In the meantime, good luck. Thanks, Alex. All right, King, up front, boy. All right, hun King! Hun! Gideon Perry waited until he saw Constable Ross return to Joe Moline's cabin and take away the dead man's body. Then he left his own cabin, and after crossing the frozen surface of the creek, he headed south into the hills. Half an hour later, he halted his team near the mouth of a cave in the hillside. Oh, oh, you huskies. Oh, oh. Leaving his sled, he approached the cave entrance. Hey, Tom. It's me, Gid. A sinister figure emerged slowly from the shadowy depths of the cave. It's about time you were showing up. I got here as soon as I could. Yeah, what happened? I told the Maoris about fine Bristow and Durham, yeah. and they believed every word of it, including the fact that they swiped the old man's gold. Sergeant Preston is chasing them right now. <laughs> good, good. 
We're sure playing in luck. You think it's safe for me to get back to your cabin? Not yet. The Mounties may come back. You better stay hold up here for a couple of days. All right. But hurry up and let me know as soon as it's safe. It ain't no fun living in a cave. Don't worry. I'll let you know. In the meantime, don't go running off with that gold. Remember, half of it's mine. Meanwhile, Hank Bristow and Lee Durham were mushing north to the border. As night fell, they halted their team and prepared to make camp in a sheltered spot beside the trail. Both men were silent and preoccupied, and neither felt any real appetite as they sat around the campfire eating their evening meal. Finally, Lee threw down his plate with an exclamation of disgust. Well, oh, rats. What's the matter? You know what the matter is as well as I do. We're in a mess and we're taking the wrong way out of it. It's better than hanging, isn't it? I'm not so sure. Do we want to be running from the law for the rest of our lives? Oh, I, I don't know. Oh, look, Hank, let's face it. We made a mistake ever trying to rob Joe in the first place. I'm sure admit that. I must have been crazy to get such an idea. It's no use crying over spilt milk, and I'm as much to blame as you are for falling in with the scheme. Well, what are we going to do about it? I, I say we go back and give ourselves up. All right. That suits me. Let's go. Lee and Hank gathered up their gear and stowed it on the sled, and then headed back toward Dawson. It was a clear, cold night, and the snow-covered trail, bordered on either side by tall pine forests, was clearly outlined in the moonlight. Several hours later, they sighted a traveler approaching in the distance. Hey, there's someone coming up ahead. Yeah, I see. A big, powerful husky was running ahead of the oncoming team as loose lead. As they drew closer, the husky charged toward them with a menacing growl. What in blazes is eating that dog? I don't know. Whoa, oh, oh, whoa, there is. Man alive, that dog means business. Hey, wait a minute. Calls a Mountie, isn't he? Yeah, you're right. Hello there, Mountie. I'm mighty glad you turned up. What do you mean by that? We were on our way to Dawson to give ourselves up. We're wanted by the law. Uh, Bristow and Durham? I'm Bristow and he's Durham, Sergeant. I suppose you were trailing us. Yes, I was. Frankly, I wasn't expecting you to surrender of your own accord. Oh, we didn't expect to either up till a couple of hours ago. But we finally got wise to ourselves. You're both armed? Lee isn't. I'm carrying a revolver. Hand it over. And needless to say, don't try any false moves while you're doing it. I don't worry. Here, Chick. Huh, 38. And it's not loaded. I took out the cartridges before we went to Joe Moline's cabin last night. This is the only gun you've had in your possession? That's right. Go ahead and search us if you like. I'll do that. All right. What made you decide to give yourselves up? Well, we realized we'd been darn fools, and our only chance of clearing ourselves was to come back and face the music. Gideon Perry has accused you two of murdering Joe Moline. We expected that, but it's not true. Maybe you'd better give me your own version of what happened. All right. It was like this. Our claim was played out. We were broke, so we got the idea... Lee Durrow made a clean breast of everything to Sergeant Preston, holding nothing back and making no attempt to excuse himself and his partner. The sergeant was impressed by his obvious sincerity. When he was through, Sergeant Preston said, I'm not saying I don't believe you, but your story certainly doesn't jive with what Gideon Perry told me. What do you mean by that? For one thing, Perry says he heard a shot, and when he rushed over to Moline's cabin, you were standing over the dead man with a gun in your hand. That's a lie. There was no shot. I never even drew my gun till after he showed up. He must be trying to frame us. He also says that after tying him up, you took Moline's gold. Well, that's not true either. The gold was gone when we got there. Search the gear on our sled if you think we have it. I shall before we leave here. Yeah? As a matter of fact, I'm rather inclined to believe your story. But even if you're telling the truth, you're still guilty of attempted robbery. So I'm placing you both under arrest in the name of the Crown. When we get to Dawson, we'll talk things over with Inspector Conrad. Next morning, at Mounted Police Headquarters, the two prisoners told their story to Inspector Conrad. The inspector listened closely and aside from a few questions, offered no comment. Instead, he turned to Sergeant Preston and said, Well, Sergeant, what do you make of their story? Well, frankly, sir, I think they're telling the truth. Hmm. I wonder if a jury would think so. There were certain facts in their favor, sir. For one thing, they surrendered voluntarily. Yes, that's true. Also, they did not have the gold in their possession when taken into custody. And Moline was killed with a forty-five, or as Bristow's guns, a thirty-eight. Well, they might have hidden the gold and gotten rid of the murder gun. In that case, they must have cooked up this story beforehand and then returned to surrender, expecting to prove their innocence. Well? Does it sound reasonable, sir, that two murderers would voluntarily stake their necks on such a crazy story? Remember, Gideon Perry was the only person who could testify against them. If they really wanted to put themselves in the clear, why didn't they shoot him and be done with it? 
Yes, I see what you mean, Sergeant. If their story is true, Perry must be trying to frame them. Did Constable Ross search Perry's cabin? Yes, he ransacked it thoroughly. He's certain the gold isn't there. Perry may have hidden it somewhere else. Unless we can find the gold, we may never be able to prove who committed the murder. Inspector, I believe Durham and Bristow are innocent. And as for trying to rob Moline, I think they've learned their lesson. If they were to help us find the real criminal and recover the gold, would you be willing to give them a second chance? Meaning, would I be willing to drop all charges against them? Yes, sir. Exactly what do you have in mind, Sergeant? Well, sir, I have a plan that may prove whether or not Gideon Perry had anything to do with this murder. Now, my idea is this. Sometime Lee Durham and Hank Bristow listened with a tense yet eager air as the sergeant explained his plan to Inspector Conrad. When he was through, the inspector drummed thoughtfully on the desk for several moments. And then he turned to the prisoners and said, You've heard the sergeant's plan. Now, if Perry should be a killer, there's a chance he'll turn desperate. You yourselves will have to carry an unloaded gun. Are you willing to take the risk involved? You bet we are. We're willing to try anything if it'll give us a chance to prove we're innocent. Very well. If you'll help us carry out this plan and it works out successfully, the Northwest Mounted will press no charges against you. That night, Gideon Perry was seated in his cabin when he heard a knock at the door. Evening, Perry. Durham and Briscoe. Yeah, both of us. Get your hands up in the air and start bagging up. What do you want? I want that gold you stole from Joe Moline's cabin. Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't give us that. We know all about the pack of lies you told the Mounties. We read the story in the Klondike Nugget. Well, I, There's only I, one reason why you should frame us. It must be because you got the gold yourself. Now hand it over. I swear I don't know what happened to the gold. Then why did you claim we took Never it? Never mind arguing with him, Lee. This gun is the only kind of talk he understands. Now then, Perry, you've already framed us for Moline's murder, so I guess it won't matter much if we kill you too. Either you hand over the gold or I pull this trigger. Which will it be? I tell you, I haven't got the gold. I'll count three and then this gun goes off. One, two. All right, all right, don't shoot. You can have the gold. Hand it over. It ain't here. I've got it hidden in a cave about two miles south of here. Get on your parker. We're going there right now. Half an hour later, the three men arrived at the cave in the hillside. Oh, 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 oh. You don't like the hurricane lantern, Lee? We'll need it to see our way around inside the cave. Good idea. A moment later, with Lee holding the lantern and Hank keeping Gid Perry covered with his gun, the three men advanced toward the cave. All right, Perry. You go first. Hold the lantern up high, Lee, so we won't lose sight of this guy. All right. Get moving, Perry. The cave seemed to be empty. But suddenly, from behind a pile of rocks, a voice barked out a sharp command. Drop that gun, Missy. Oh, I said drop that gun. All right, pick it up, kid. I sure will, Tom. I sure will. All right, you with the lantern. Hand that over to Gid, too. Yeah. Don't try any funny stuff. Let's just squeeze this trigger at the first sign of a false move. Yeah, that's better. Who are these varmints, Gid? They're Durham and Bristol. They showed up at the cabin tonight and put a gun on me. They figured out that I'd swipe Moline's gold. They wanted me to lead them to it. Oh, they did, eh? <laughs> well, gents, the gold is here, right over behind them rocks where I was hiding. But it ain't gonna do you too much good. I suppose it was you who killed Joe Moline. That's right, I did kill him. Then you two showed up very conveniently to take the rap. And who are you? Well, now, uh, it happens I'm Gid's brother, Tom Perry. But I reckon you two have heard of me under a different name. Never mind boasting about who you are. Let's hurry up and get rid of them. Yeah, sure. And when we do, the law will think they made their getaway over the border. I'll plug one, you plug the other. Here goes. Uh, hey, what? Why, uh, Thunder, the gun's empty. Sure. We brought you here with a gun that wasn't loaded. Well, this gun is loaded. Now, uh, take care of both of you. Stop that gun. Uh, Come here. Instantly, God. Tom grabbed Hank around the waist and swung him around to use him as a shield. At the same time, he fired. The shot missed as Preston flung himself flat to the ground. Tom fired again. But Hank had knocked him off balance, and the shot went wild. At that same moment, Lee made a dive for Gid, but the crook felled him with a single blow of the empty gun. As Gid dropped the lantern and made a wild rush for freedom, he was stopped by Sergeant Preston. Oh, you don't! The sergeant's fist caught him square on the jaw, knocking him to the ground. But Gid picked himself up and charged back at the sergeant. You won't stop me, Preston. Hold on. Gid Perry was fighting for his life, but his desperate fury was no match for the sergeant's cool skill. It wasn't long before the sergeant knocked him down again, and this time he stayed down. Watching things. 
Meanwhile, Hank and Tom were rolling on the ground, locked in a deadly grapple. Hank had seized Tom's wrist and was twisting it so that he couldn't bring his gun to bear. While King stood guard over Gid, the sergeant walked over to the struggling pair. Let go of that gun and lie still or you're a dead man. Okay, okay, I'm doing it there. That's better. Pull away from him, Hank. Stand clear. Deadly, Sergeant. Now then, Perry, get on your feet. Yes, yes. You and your brother are under arrest in the name of the Crown. Later, when the two crooks had been handcuffed and Lee Durham had been revived, the sergeant recovered the stolen gold from the spot where it had been hidden. Hank said to him, How about it, Sergeant? Does this clear us of that murder charge? Yes, Hank, it does. I overheard Tom Perry's confession, and this gold will clinch the case against Tom and his brother. I sure was glad to hear your voice when Tom Perry started to shoot us. I didn't know whether you'd followed us or not. Yes, I trailed the three of you, and you left Gid Perry's cabin. I expected him to lead you to the place where the gold was hidden, but I didn't know whether or not he had an accomplice. Oh, uh, incidentally, you two have a reward coming. Re- reward? That's right. When I saw Tom Perry's face, I recognized him as a notorious outlaw known as the Yukon Kid. There was a $10,000 reward offered for his capture. Ten th- Holy, but you're the one who really captured him, Sergeant. The Northwest Mounted Police don't accept rewards. Besides, he never would have been captured without your help. $10,000? Well, golly, Hank, you realize what that means? I sure do. It means our troubles are over. And now that Moline's murder is solved, this case is closed. We now take you to Northwest Mounted Police Headquarters in Dawson. You sent for me, Inspector? Yes, Sergeant. A young miner named Chris Radford has disappeared under mysterious circumstances. What are the circumstances, sir? According to his wife, he received a visit last night from a stranger, a man who answers the description of Hawk Webster, the outlaw. I want you to locate young Radford, Sergeant. Find out if he's mixed up with Radford's gang. All right, sir. I'll get on the case immediately. Come along, King. Hawk Webster is a ruthless killer. And if he should prove to be involved in this case... Sergeant Preston will be facing one of his most dangerous assignments. Yes, there's no telling what may happen if his search for Chris Radford should bring him up against Hawk Webster and his gang. Be sure to listen to this next exciting adventure, The Spread Eagle Raid. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you once each week until September when we shall resume our regular Monday, Wednesday, and Friday broadcasts. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck until our next broadcast. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.